Our next case is Kramer versus Transitional <coughs> Health. This is a 20 minute grant. Welcome, Council. You may reserve some of your time if we do not use it up um, and ask that you do your best to keep track of your own time. And you have uh, two minutes of a free fire zone. Please begin when you're ready. Good morning, Justices. I'm Roger Klein, uh, plaintiff, uh, plaintiff Appellant Agnes Kramer's attorney. Uh, I want to tell you how grateful I am to even be here today and to be able to adjust the issues that you've assigned us. Um, the first issue you assigned is whether the four-factor test in Martin v. Pontiac School District is at odds with the principle that a pre-existing condition is not a bar for workers' compensation benefits, and whether B, it conflicts with the plain meaning of MCL 418-3012. We believe it does both. The four-factor test in Martin v. Public, Pontiac Public Schools is a bar to eligibility for mental disability workers' compensation benefits because its focus is wrong. Section 3012 begins, mental disabilities are compensable. The four-factor test fails to recognize that the initial inquiry must be an understanding of the mental illness, the disease. Without the initial inquiry into the presence of the mental illness, application of factoring contributor test is improper. What is the mental illness? What has been the progression of the mental illness? Medication, symptoms, functioning. How is the pre-existing condition affecting function prior to the alleged work injury? Yost v. Detroit Board of Education decision understood the initial inquiry must concern this pre-existing condition. They stated the full extent of the underlying pre-existing condition must be understood when determining whether the workplace injury significantly contributed to a disabling condition. In Farrington, the Total Petroleum, an occupational heart case, this, co this court stated, the op occupational factors must now be considered together with the totality of claimant's health circumstance to analyze whether the heart injury was significantly caused by work-related events. Without an initial inquiry into the mental illness, application of factoring and contributor test is improper. The Martin test is misplaced. It stresses contributors, stressors, counting those types of things. You have to look at the significance of the contributors on the impact of the mental illness. Our brief explains how the contributor analysis is biased and will identify the most significant contributor, not whether a work injury was a significant cause of disability. My brief at page 13 cites several commission decisions which criticized Martin in particular, TAG versus General Motors. Noted Council, that I, Council, good morning. Just a, a, a quick question in this situation. The, the, the client or the, your, the individual in question also had uh, significant physical symptoms, correct? Yes. Okay. I don't know how else to say that. No, that's, thank you. I, I just, I, I just wanted to. Yeah, you that know, was a, a contention at trial, yeah. <laughs> and I'd be happy with the mental, but the physical was there as well. There were physical, there were significant physical symptoms that arose from the incident, correct? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Can you, can you, what, what do you propose the test to be if Martin is not correct? Is it sort of, Martin's okay as long as you have this initial step of saying what is the, what is the existing, you know, what's the precondition? And then Martin's okay, or do you need that precondition and something different than Martin because Martin loads it against compensability? No, Martin has to go. Um, 
We think the test should be a definition for significance. And we've asked that the significance be interpreted as A, uh, um, noticeably or measurably large extent. Martin, you know, lays out these factors, raw mathematics, relative contribution, duration, permanent effect. You can't just count, the, and worse, the, the application of that to just counting these stressors up and determining that's the cause. Again, that's gonna get you to the most or the most significant cause, not a significant cause. To the, you know, Martin had it, the first factor was raw mathematics. That's clearly wrong. That's not how you determine a significance. Relative contribution. Now, contribution is important, but contribution incur includes their next test of duration and their next test of permanent effect. You don't need Martin and their factors and their counting. You look to the mental illness. How was the mental illness beforehand? Was there a mental disease? I gotta tell you, in my case, that's pretty questionable, but uh, what was the mental condition? What were the symptoms? How were people functioning? Maybe they had home problems. Maybe their kids were terrible. Maybe they had lots of stressors in their life. How was the mental disease? Were they coping? So How step one should be, is there a pre-existing condition to begin with? I mean, isn't that the beginning of the analysis? Well, yes. Precisely. Right. I mean, and somehow that got washed away in my case. Did, that, did but, that happen here? I mean, yeah, exactly. It doesn't appear it happened. No, it happened. Didn't happen. But in the broad sense of the statute and practice, you have to investigate whether there was a pre-existing condition. And and there's also the broader problem of mental illness. I mean, it isn't just depression. You know, there's all kinds of psychoses and. Psychiat psychiatric diagnosis I couldn't even enumerate for you. So, you know, some are maybe clearly out because they're just schizophrenics or whatever, okay? Uh, that would be, you look to beforehand, what were their problems? If they're schizophrenic, they're gonna have lots of problems beforehand. Um, I like the, um, where was that? That wasn't yours, it was, um, Yeah, it was Yost. Yost's footnote, where they had the hypothetical about the person with the cardiac problems. You know, he had heart disease, he had bad cholesterol, he was a walking time bomb. And he walks up a stair at work and has a heart attack. He probably walks upstairs all the time. So you have to look at the disease, the underlying problem, and then you look at the work event. Was that? significant in the progression of this gentleman who had this severe heart problem when he walks upstairs all the time? Yost was right. It's not compensable, okay? But you have to look at the disease. Where's the status of the disease? Then you look to what happened at work, outside stressors if important, but counting them, the, 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 the whole application is wrong. I mean, to just count these contributors, that's, that's just not right. It's not, well, it doesn't determine to, a significant don't contribution. Don't you have to line them up in some fashion before you can make a qualitative analysis? I mean, if you say count them, I mean, you have to list them so that then you can make some quantitative or qualitative analysis, right, of which one <coughs> contributed, which, you know, whether there was pre-existing situation and how significant the work event was. Are you, are you saying we should, there shouldn't be an accounting? Well, I think they have to be examined, but you can't. Oh, he had this lifetime of this or that, but how was he functioning? I mean, there's no case that says if there's four outside contributors and one, one uh, workplace uh, contributing factor, that's enough, is there? Is there any, any case that holds that? I mean, that's just sort of the four. Point. Did you say four outside and one at work? Yeah, they're just based well, on. Well, that's what Martin point. says. So Martin says just count, and if the count is more outside than inside, the, the analysis is over. That's right. Your, that's your interpretation of Martin. Yeah. Really? Yeah, that's my interpretation. 
So when Martin says, look at all these other factors, look at factors that we didn't list, no factor alone is conclusive, no, it didn't mean any of those things. It only meant count them, and if the counting is more outside than inside, you're done? That's how I read it. Now you have to look at the one, okay? How significant was the one on the mental illness? Did everything change at that point? The medications, they're functioning at work, socially? You have to look at the impact of those stressors. I mean, you can talk about stressors in life, but the whole statute has to interpret how it caused the disability. Was it a significant contributor? Isn't a big problem that's happened um, in these workers' comp cases that Martin, it, that the magistrates often are just following the four factor or the you know the factor test, but they're not looking at the totality of the circumstances? Isn't that yeah, one of the big that's problems? That's what's happening. Exactly. But but beyond that, so that's one problem. But then additionally, we have this particularly factor one where you're counting up external non-work concerns with work concerns. Correct, yeah. Okay. But that sounds like then you're saying that the, the tribunals aren't following Martin because Martin says the factors it listed should be considered, quote, together with the totality of claimant's health circumstances to analyze whether the injury was significantly caused by work-related events. So that sounds like a complaint that the tribunals aren't following Martin. Well, that's or is Martin true. inconsistent where it says that it can be satisfied only when a four-factor test is met? Right. So, I mean, the Martin test itself is inconsistent. And so the bar is left, and the judges, the magistrates. Some are following it, some are not. Some are giving it, saying it's a hard and fast test, and some are saying, well, it's considered, and some are saying, I don't think it's, it makes and any sense, and I'm really not even following it. Not to talk politics, but, you know, when there's a conservative... Uh, uh, appellate commission, that's what I, I believe happened in my case. It was easier just to say, nope, 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 you, do, you lose. Um, there is a second issue that you assigned us <laughs> that is concerning our case and an issue of asking whether we should, if Martin is the appropriate test, uh, um, did the uh, Court of Appeals err in its last decision uh, affirming the Kramer Commission and, and their application, and they also asked as to whether they had uh, discussed Yoast. Well, the Court of Appeals did err in affirming the Appellate Commission because the Commission summarily concluded the magistrate discussed the Martin case and various contributors without the quantitative and qualitative review required of an, uh, a Commission decision. The Kramer Commission panel acknowledged its duty to perform that do, uh, examination, but failed to do so. The Commission's review of the magistrate's findings as the plaintiff's testimony, numerous experts, excuse me, back up. The Commission did review <coughs> extensively plaintiff's testimony, the uh, uh, doctors and the medical experts, but when it came to the application of Martin, it took six sentences to review all that. They didn't review the documents, the evidence, in light of each factor. It took them six sentences to, do, to cover all that material in the analysis of Martin. Only the summary, summary conclusion that the magistrate had cited Martin and had concluded the non-occupational stressors outweighed the occupational stressors. That's not a significant manner test. That's a most significant manner test or a most substantial. I mean, when you count these numbers up and do it mathematically, you're going to get to a different result than the statute implies. The statute says a significant contribution. Uh, so we think the uh, matter should be reversed and sent back to the Appellate Commission for a total review of the whole facts and circumstances to have an, uh, uh, the Appellate Commission review those, uh, uh, the matter all over again 
and even under Martin, that the Martin Appellate Commission did not perform the, an adequate investigation, analysis, and explanation of their decision. Also, I would point out, uh, YO stands for the proposition that you need more than one straw that broke the camel's back. The magistrate touched on Yost, one straw that broke the camel's back, that phrase, but did not specifically cite Yost. She quoted Martin instead as saying, a pure last event analysis will never satisfy this standard. That's not the command of Yost. The Yost decision cautions against a pure last event analysis. But its lengthy footnote on page two acknowledges a last event may be sufficient. Quote, I'll quote, the weight of the event must be compared with the severity of claimant's pre-existing condition in order to determine significance. So it was important for the commission to discuss Yos. It did not. And for the Court of Appeals to say that the, uh, 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 the commission did discuss Yos, they were wrong. They didn't discuss it. We asked the commission to discuss Yos. Still, the commission did not discuss Yos. So to summarize, I would say to you that if Martin is the appropriate test, this court should reverse the matter, send it back to the Workers' Compensation Appellate Commission because of the legally insufficient and inadequate review that was previously performed, and for the clarification as to how Martin and Yo's commands apply to Ms. Kramer's case. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Well, I'll reserve like my reserve? remaining time. Okay. Good, good morning, and may it please the court. Jeffrey Wagner appearing on behalf of the Appellees. I had a different opening planned out, Your Honors, but as I sat here kind of mesmerized by some of the complex med mal issues that the court was grappling with this morning, I had kind of a head scratching moment where, wow, it would be nice if perhaps the legislature had considered making some type of administrative or quasi judicial body to chime in and provide guidance, subject matter expertise on the difficult issues that arise over the course of practice. Uh, well, I'm happy to say we have that in the case that's before you right now in the form of the Workers' Compensation Appellate Commission. And for the past 20 years, the commission's test in Martin, which consists of four parts, which I'll touch on later, has served as a useful but non-exhaustive guide to help workers' comp practitioners address and analyze the complex issue of psychological injury cases. Uh, Martin, moreover, does two very important things that I'd like to touch on. First, it furthers the express directive from our legislature in 1980 to adopt a heightened causation standard that did away with the subjective honest belief standard uh, that was established by the Desiel case and became kind of a political football in the 70s. And equally important, number two, it seizes directly on express language from this court's prior decisions in Farrington and Gardner that calls unequivocally for the balancing of occupational and non-occupational factors in the course of resolving whether a given claimant is satisfied the causation requirements of section 3012. In the Court of Appeals thorough opinion below, Judge Jensen took note of those policies in her majority opinion and correctly concluded that no conflict exists between the uh, non-exhaustive and optional four-part test that was offered by the magistrates and Martin, and moreover that she saw no cogent reason to discard. Counsel, good morning. Good morning, Judge. It, I, you know, I, I, as you know, my jurisprudential philosophy is to take cases and kind of try to narrow them down to make them as simplistic and practical as possible. And I just want to kind of review the issues that we're kind of facing here today and ask for you to kind of comment on, con comment on those if you could. In the case that is currently being presented, you have an individual who was violently electrocuted and fell off of a ladder in changing a light bulb, 
correct? That's correct, Judge. Okay. I agree with those facts. It's a pretty violent injury. They displayed physical, they had a concussion, and there were physical injuries that arose from this, uh, which has all been kind of elaborated, I think, in the file. So you have a person, they get electrocuted violently, they fall from a ladder, so they fall from you know, a relatively significant height because they're changing a light bulb. They have some pretty significant physical comp complications that arise, as well as psychological. Doesn't it trouble you, and I'm just gonna just be uh, direct, I find it troublesome that we get into something that happened five years prior to this, and that ultimately a person who sustains significant physical injury from a violent fall has to now contend with the notion of spousal abuse. Like, don't, do you see how this can, can really create a problematic and quite concerning uh, appreciation of the circumstance that, that we're facing? The fact that from five years back, you, you can, everyone has stressors in their life. Everybody has challenges in their life. There's no question you had a pretty intense injury at the workplace. There's no question there were some physical components that came with it. You know, we do have the psychological elements that arise from it. But do you see what the concern is as it pertains to Martin, as it pertains to the interpretation of Martin, as it pertains to whether Martin should even be relevant anymore or should there be a new test? When ultimately we all have these challenges in our life, we all have difficulties in our life, but the notion that spousal abuse that this individual went through is now being brought up as a main con con contributing factor is concerning, is it not? I would agree with you that the facts of the case are downright tragic and I don't think you would find a single person to disagree with that. But at the end of the day, applying the specific heightened causation standard that we have here, this court has indicated on numerous prior occasions that a totality of the circumstances balancing test is in order. And that required looking at not only things that occurred prior to the uh, incident in which Ms. Kramer fell from the ladder, but also things that happened in the interim. So for instance, there was a falling out with the family that occurred in 2013 and 14 after the accident, as well as a suicide attempt that stemmed from uh, a dispute. No, 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 I, I, I understand all the facts of the record. I'm just saying is, could it not be the case that the instant case before us really creates the situation where perhaps this court has to revisit Martin because of how it's being argued and ultimately could be applied in this case? I, I don't, I, I, I take your point, Justice Bernstein. Uh, I don't think that there's anything in the specific application of Martin set forth in either the Court of Appeals decision or the appellate commission's decision before that, that deviates from either the general <coughs> totality of the circumstances balancing test that this court referenced in Gardner and Farrington, or the more narrow four-factor uh, approach to conducting that balancing test that uh, Martin set forth and that other panels of the appellate commission have applied since that time. So for instance, if I could draw an analogy to one of the cases that uh, we cite in our brief in response, because there, there's a line of argumentation in the uh, appellant's brief that Martin puts a thumb on the scale of the test in section 3012 that makes it either difficult or impossible for claimants to win. And we spent a lot of time in our brief citing cases to suggest that that's simply not true. Uh, when the facts are presented in a way that uh, jives with the statute, claimants prevail all the time. So a similar case is the Thalia matter, which we cite in our brief, which involved a shoulder injury on the job that resulted in some resultant psychological injuries after the fact. And in conduct in similar, not nearly as extensive history in terms of trauma and um, you know, violation of bodily autonomy like we have here from a spouse, but the, the tribunal looked at, okay, there's four failed surgeries on this shoulder injury. There is significant depression and emotional distress as a result of not being able to work because of the uh, fallout from the shoulder injury, but conversely, not a whole lot of uh, testimony in either 
the, um, the record or in the medical records that uh, Mr. Thalia was particularly concerned about other issues that he was facing in his personal life. So I think although the facts, <clears throat> the facts of this case are certainly uh, very severe and tragic, I don't think that there is any deviation from the either how this court has defined the balancing test in more general terms or in the more specific four-factor approach that uh, Martin set forth or the commission has done after the case. Counsel, um, I, I asked um, Brother Counsel the same question. In this case, was there ever a, a finding of a pre-existing condition? Isn't that really step one of the analysis that there was a pre-existing condition to then do the measuring to see if there was aggravation? I would agree that the analysis could have been more precise on that point, Justice Welch, but I would submit that I think in both the Court of Appeals opinion and in the administrative opinions before that, the condition was kind of just defined in more general terms as either a psychological injury or uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which resulted in some outward physical manifestations in the way of uh, what they call non-epileptic seizures. Uh, in uh, the various medical testimony from the party's experts. So, where, uh, where was that in the in the record, though? I'm sorry. Where was that in the record? The in the testimony. And from anything pre-existing. I mean, you said it, it was it was general. Where what were they pointing to in the in the record? The, I I had difficulty seeing that. I, um, I think, based on what Justice Welch has, has been asking, I think we're we're having some difficulty seeing where that pre-existing condition, that first step even came in. Mm -hmm. Understood. In terms of the record evidence that would have supported Ms. Kramer dealing with pre-existing psychological issues before, I think it just came through in the testimony of Ms. Kramer herself when she was asked about the, again, admittedly traumatic uh, events of her past. But also, for instance, in the testimony of Dr. Thomas, plaintiff's own expert, uh, she was asked uh, at length about, okay, when you're dealing with these types of uh, non-epileptic non seizures, uh, what types of factors are often the most leading cause, and she identified uh, the very type of uh, abuse and uh, spousal issues that, uh, that Ms. Kramer unfortunately had to deal with. So again, I, I don't disagree that the record is a bit, I guess, opaque on that point, but uh, there are references in both the testimony from Ms. Kramer as well as both parties, uh, medical professionals, that she did deal with psychological issues in the time prior to the workplace incident. Okay, and then uh, I'm thinking you're probably not gonna wanna answer this question, um, <laughs> but if we were to decide to, re to replace Martin, what would, what would you suggest that that, that, that look like? <clears throat> I would suggest that if the court were going, and you're right that I don't wanna answer that question, but I will try to. <laughs> If the court were to go down that road, I would submit that the proper course would be to put itself in the shoes of Commissioner Prisvilla when he sat down to write the Martin opinion in the, uh, I guess it was published in 2001, so it probably would have been sometime in 2000. And start, the starting point would be the text of the statute, the legislative history that came before it, and the fact that Gardner and Farrington call for balancing, but I think that the proper move, as it were, then, would be to basically just put some specific parameters or factors in place that would instruct practitioners how to go about doing that totality of the circumstances. Should test. proximity matter if something happened right after an injury, for example? You're, you're referring to temporal proximity? Temporal proximity, yeah. Sure, and I don't think anything in Martin rules out uh, the tribunal considering other factors. And in fact, Martin expressly refers to its four-factor test as a guide, to borrow a phrase from uh, one of the very excellent amicus briefs that was submitted in this case, Martin's not a straitjacket, it's a guide. It is designed to be flexible to allow the triers of fact, in this case magistrate judges, to look at the applicable causation standard, consider all the evidence that has been put forth into the record, and determine if, in fact, the heightened causation standard that the legislator chose to adopt in the 1980s has been met. And in, in many ways, Your Honor, in terms of the arguments that are made against Martin, I feel like the, we're almost in a bizarro type world where the Martin, the Martin test that I'm forced to respond to bears very little resemblance to the actual text of that particular decision. So for instance, there's the argument that Martin somehow creates a presumption in favor of non-compensability. At no point in that very thorough 22-page opinion will you identify a presumption. And, 
in her opinion below, Judge Jansen was pretty uh, adamant on that point. Can you give me, what would be your, you, you, you talked about, and I don't necessarily disagree that, that uh, you know, claimants can win under Martin, um, and you gave an example of, of a case where, and I forget the name that, that you cited, but where, where the individual did not have significant sort of pre-existing um, mental problems, and yet this injury did cause the depression from not being able to work and those sort of things, and that was compensable. Is there a case, or what is the best case, in your opinion, showing not that type of plain, claimant, but a claimant who does have some significant, what, what have you, other non-work related um, stressors or causes of, of mental or emotional issues, and the work injury still was found to be compensable under Martin? I'm glad you asked that, Justice Kavanaugh. I was worried I wasn't going to get to that point as, we, as I address some of the other questions. Uh, from the court today. The case that directly answers your question is the trailer matter, which we cite in our brief. It is a decision involving a court reporter who dealt with significant pre-existing emotional issues as a result of a murder-suicide incident involving her sister <coughs> and her um, former husband, who was a police officer. Traumatic by any metric, I don't think anyone would disagree. In looking at the way Martin was applied to the trailer case, the court counted the contributors, as Mr. Klein mentioned, and saw that, okay, we basically see four contributors, one being the uh, workplace event, the others being uh, pre-existing personal issues, and in our view, one out of four is significant, a 250 batting average is pretty good. Um, so with respect to that, I think the case would be directly on point, but moreover, it would address one of the questions that was posed to Brother Counsel about the, the manner in which the first factor works in terms of counting the contributors, it, it is a raw mathematical inquiry, but you don't, need to prov you don't need to have more workplace than non-workplace to win. As evidenced by the trailer case, one out of four is a pretty good batting average. Likewise, in the Thalia case that I mentioned before, similar thing, they said one out of three in terms of the number of contributors would be sufficient. And then as the uh, trailer commission panel went through the remaining Martin factors, they said, yeah, although in our view, the murder-suicide and the obvious uh, fallout from that was the most, the most significant factor, the fact that this court reporter was forced to essentially relive that incident by virtue of her job, which reported her recording the record for similarly traumatic incidents that are making their way through uh, you know, Michigan courtrooms every day, they concluded that it might not be the most significant, but it doesn't need to be under the express terms of Martin. It was still on balance something that was both vital or of consequence, a consequence, excuse me, which is dovetails with the specific legal term of art definition that the Martin panel gave to the phrase in the most significant manner in its opinion. And uh, on, on that point, uh, I had a really entertaining back and forth with, uh, with Judge Shapiro in the Court of Appeals on that point, and uh, he, he was skeptical of the manner in which the Martin Commission panel selected the particular definition of significant that it did. And I would submit that if one takes a step back and does a, even a remotely thorough reading of that 22-page opinion, this is not an instance where a uh, panel is simply picking friends out of a crowd or using whatever euphemism one might use to make a critique on a textualist analysis. The, Commission went, was very thorough in terms of listing uh, the various dictionary definitions that have been applied by courts when trying to place a definition on a similar causation standard. It looked for guidance from similar systems from some of our sister jurisdictions and likewise took note of the legislative history that preceded the 1980 amendments, which this court specifically said in Gardner one must not lose sight of what was intended to be done with these 1980 amendments, and that was to move away from the subjective honest disability standard and put something in place that has some teeth. So while I would certainly concede that the primary purpose of the Workers' Compact is to be a remedial statute to provide injuries, or provide compensation to injured workers, there are other dimensions of that too. And when the legislator made these 1980 amendments, which is the specific part of the statute that's currently before the court, it was attempting to remedy what it perceived uh, 
as a problem in terms of the standard not being workable, it being entirely subjective, and throwing the current state of workers' compensation jurisprudence uh, and making it a bit of a mess. The legislature stepped in and it attempted to create a fix. This court has, on at least two occasions, chimed in and said that, yes, in our view, this particular amendment calls for a balancing of occupational factors on one hand, non-occupational on the other. And then, subsequent to that, the Workers' Compensation Appellate Commission has stepped in and has attempted to, uh, as it were, fill in some of the gaps and provide some interpretive guidance on how to go about complying with this court's directives in Gardner and Farrington and the legislature's directives when it adopted those 1980 amendments. And the last point I, I'll hit on as I see my time is coming to an end, uh, in Judge Shapiro's dissent there is an issue raised about whether the commission was exceeding the scope of its administrative authority and getting into formal rulemaking as opposed to uh, interpretive guidance. And I would submit that the answer to that question is no. If we look at the Fisher case, which was cited in the dissent, that's a situation where you had a panel creating a wholesale fraud uh, exception to the recoupment laws, which exists nowhere in the text, spirit, or intent of the act. I think the better analogy would be the um, Court of Appeals decision authored by uh, then Judge and eventually Justice Corrigan in the, trying to blank on it, the Fairchild case, excuse me, which dealt with qualifications for state disability benefits. The legislature had adopted a definition, but had not really provided guidance on how the practitioners, the people, in the trenches dealing with this law on a daily basis should go about interpreting that and seeing who does and who doesn't qualify. I think this particular uh, test set forth by the Martin panel is a perfect example of our general separation powers structure of government working to a T. The legislature has created a law. This court has chimed in and identified balancing of occupational and non-occupational factors as the general parameters on how to apply it. And then the administrative body with subject matter expertise has helped fill in the gaps and tried to create a standard that works for everyone. Thank you. You have three minutes and 18 seconds remaining. Well, it won't take that long. Okay. <laughs> I philosophically disagree with how Martin approaches our problem here today. I think which Martin looks at it from a stressor point of view. I think it should be looked at from the mental illness point of view. What was the mental illness before? What was their functioning? What was the disease process, if it existed? How did the disease change after the accident, after the alleged work injury? Did the disease, did the work injury impacts significantly that disease process to disability. That's my position. Now we had said, uh, I think in my brief I suggested a definition of uh, measurably or large extent to try to define how much change in that disease would be compensable. But I just think you have to look at it from the other side, from the disease process how did work impact that process to disability or not? Was that significant? Was it significant? Uh, 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 now I'm forgetting the phrase. Perceptually ex large extent. Thank you. I thank you for later. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, the case will be submitted.